Hello, I'm Paul Glazew. I'm Professor of Evidence-Based Practice at Bond University and shortly to retire. So leading up to my retirement, I've been thinking about my uh, career and the things that I had wished I had known at the beginning of my career. So I'd like to give a short talk on five lessons from a zigzag career in research and clinical medicine. So I was a GP for many years during my academic career. I wanted to give a warning first of all though, and that's my research career in particular has been very non-linear. The topics seem to wander all over the place, from diagnostic theory in my PhD to trials, screening evidence-based medicine, reviews of respiratory tract infections, more trials, some monitoring work, research waste and overdiagnosis. And looking at this, it might look like a bit of a mess, so I'm going to try and make it more coherent, or at least I could get some help. You might remember Mr. Squiggle, who used to take some squiggly lines and be able to make a coherent picture out of it. So I'm going to get Mr. Squiggle to help me draw a coherent picture out of my career. First of all, as context, I just wanted to briefly go through my linear version of the career and that is that when I finished medicine I did a few years in the hospitals and then I did some locums that I'll talk about and then I did a PhD in diagnostic decision theory um, mostly with Jörn Hilden at the um, University of Copenhagen in Denmark and then after that moved to um, Sydney University where I did research and teaching in particular with John Symes and Les Erwig to eminent clinical trials and epidemiologists there. But I was also inspired to go back into clinical work. I was doing emergency medicine on a Friday night. Um, and then I moved to the University of Queensland for several years, again working in emergency department at first, but then retraining as a general practitioner. In 2003, I moved to Oxford University to become the uh, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine there and take over the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in the Department of Primary Care in Oxford. And then finally I returned after seven years there um, to Bond University where I've been for the last 14 years and that was on an NHMRC Australia Fellowship. Let me return to one of those locums back in the early days though. Um, one of the locums I did was at Collinsville Hospital, a mining town in North Queensland, where I was the local GP but would also take care of the hospital in the mornings. So I'd do a normal ward round first of all, but then I had to do a second ward round to work on everybody's rubrics cubes who was trying to solve it. It was a big craze at the time. And I often think of my whole career really in medicine as being my ability to solve puzzles like rubrics cubes to the system of research and medicine, um, sort of using that skill for good. So that is background. I now want to draw what Mr. Squiggle would, which is the sort of research strategy that that squiggly line actually looks like, that zigzag. So let's now take a look at that. So here's what Mr. Squiggle may have drawn as a research strategy. In particular, what should I work on? Um, and so it took me a while to learn this, but I should focus on big problems. But you can only take small steps. You can't get up the mountain in one leap. And you need to document and understand those problems, particularly with the help of end users. Thirdly, you need to learn from previous attempts at similar research journeys. Fourth, you may not have the best tools to do it, so build better tools but don't get distracted by the tools themselves. Remember the purpose is getting up that big problem. And finally, um, an aside really, is keep your focus on the big problem, but be alert to interesting accidents as well. And I want to go through and illustrate each of these issues in going through that research career of mine. Okay. So when I went, it was at the University of Sydney, I was introduced to Dave Sackett. He came out from McMaster to run some workshops for us before the term evidence-based medicine was even invented by his, one of his pupils, Gordon Guyatt. Um, and Dave's big problem was the evidence practice gap. That is the gap between what we know from research and what we do in practice. And to illustrate that, when Dave was working 
um, at the John Radcliffe in Oxford as the professor of evidence-based medicine. He used to take a thing called the evidence cart, which had all of the previous medline, plus all of their previous critically appraised topics loaded up on it. And during the ward round, questions would come up about the treatment of, or testing of particular patients. And they would do the literature searches there on the ward round. That was the so-called evidence cart, which Sharon Strauss wrote up the results of. Um, that was a revolutionary thing to do. What he was doing really was bringing out continuing medical education into the ward round. Of course, it made ward rounds a bit longer. And I attended some of Dave Sackett's workshops back in the 1990s and learned about this whole process of evidence-based medicine. And that became my big problem. That is, how do we solve the evidence practice gap but particularly in primary care, which was my interest areas. So to give you one example of the gaps that I discovered in trying to work on that problem, I used to work in a practice in Beaumont Street in Oxford. Um, and one day a patient came in and said um, they were a long-term smoker with a chronic obstructive airways disease who had recently quit smoking. And they'd tried medications, but they didn't like the adverse effects of those and asked me, are there any breathing exercises that I could recommend? And I thought about this because I used to edit for about 10 years the Journal of Evidence-Based Medicine where we would scan the world literature, 140 journals roughly, and take from those the very best research that was applicable to clinical practice, things that were both valid and important for clinical practice, which turns out to be a very small number. But one of them, was a randomised controlled trial of patients just like my one with chronic obstructive airways disease using a didgeridoo and it showed improvement. So I mentioned this to him. I said, well, I know about a trial with didgeridoos. And he said, that's great, doc. Can you prescribe a didgeridoo on the National Health Service? Well, um, I couldn't do that. But I realised that even if I could, I didn't know exactly how to prescribe the didgeridoo. So I didn't know the instructions. TDS is three times daily, but I didn't know the instructions. So the second thing is to document and understand the problem. So Carl Hennigan, who's now the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, and I worked through one year of the Evidence-Based Medicine Journal of these highly important research articles, and we just looked at the 80 that were on effective treatments that had been abstracted and asked one question. Could you use this treatment with a patient tomorrow? Well, overall, that was about 50%. It was better for trials than it was for meta-analyses of trials. It was better for drugs than it was for non-drugs, but none of them got over 70%. But the thing I really noticed was that for, non, for trials, sorry, for meta-analyses of non-drugs, it was very bad. So we had a problem with meta-analysis and we had a problem with non-drug treatments. Problem across the board, but worse there. So that gave me a new problem to work on. Um, so later on, when I'd moved to Bond, I worked on this with Tammy Hoffman. We did an analysis of the big six um, general medical journals and their trials of non-drug treatments. Um, and we analysed all of those in a single year and came up with a fairly similar result to the early one. That is, there was very low replication. The dark bar there you'll see was about a 40% initial rate of being able to replicate the intervention. But even after we'd written to authors and done other things to try and find extra information, we could only get it up to 61%. And that led us, as a potential partway solution, to write the tidier statement, a checklist for what you should put into the description of a treatment that you've tested in a clinical trial or indeed in any sort of study. How to make it replicable for both uh, researchers and for clinicians. So that's my first really um, big problem in general was to not only get the evidence out to people but in order that GPs could use this information I needed to solve the problem of the non-drug treatments. Well, one of the other problems of the non-drug treatments is that even if we could get the descriptions of the interventions, even if we knew what was effective, we didn't have a place to go to find them. So 
Carl and I proposed back in 2005 that we develop a repository which we called hypothetically the Handbook of Non-Drug Interventions. The British Medical Journal, the BMJ, did a pilot but eventually rejected this because of commercial reasons. But the College of GPs in Australia in 2010 thought it was a very good idea. They accepted that. Um, and so in two, we started the uh, Handy Up and then in 2013 we were ready to launch Handy. That was before the work that I just mentioned, by the way, on the poor descriptions and the tidier templates. So there's lots of work, research work still to do. This is like building the plane while it's flying. But it's been very successful in the decade since. It's become well known by Australian GPs. About a third of them in a recent survey we did are using Handy regularly and most of them are aware of Handy. And now what we'd like to do is internationalize that. Okay. Big problem, partway solution, though it's taken a long time, notably over 10 years from um, handy beginning um, to uh, the, the current common use and almost a decade before that of researching about the problems. But bigger problems as well. So I'm going to go back to Oxford for a moment and I'm pointing out Ian Chalmers, who is the founder of a thing called the Cochrane Collaboration, which was aiming to systematically review basically all the medical literature. And Ian founded that in the nine, early 1990s. So Ian and I used to go when I was in um, Oxford to the Sunday morning coffee concerts in the Holywell Music Room. They were called coffee concerts because there was a free coffee that you could have beforehand. And so we used to sit and talk about research ideas. And one of them that we were talking about was how do you go from what patients would like researched to the end product of patient benefits? That is, how do we get through that whole process? Ian was particularly concerned with the fact that a lot of research didn't really answer the questions that were relevant to clinicians and patients. But as you just saw, I was very concerned with the incomplete and unusable reports of research that was being published. Even if it was good research, it couldn't be replicated by patients or clinicians. And we were th tossing up between these two um, ideas when I scribbled on a piece of paper. Um, well, it wasn't quite a napkin, I don't think, but a small piece of paper that I had with me while we are having coffee. I said, I think we can actually quantify each of the stages. We've also been interested in the poor design of research and the non-publication of trials at all. And if you put those together, I think it's about an 85% waste that we can quantify. And we published this in The Lancet in um, 2009, that there was about an 85% research waste, which adds up to over $100 billion per year. Yes, $100 billion. Well, that got a reasonable amount of attention um, but not huge changes. But coming back to the research strategy for a moment, this was both a bigger problem and an interesting accident. So I had realized that there was this problem that we had with non-drug interventions, but behind that was an even bigger mountain in the clouds. And so while I didn't lose interest in the non-drug interventions, I saw it as one part of this even larger problem that we were facing. So later on, we published a more detailed analysis of that 2009 paper about adding value and reducing waste in research, adding one stage to this, which is the efficient regulation and delivery of research. But we quantified the same steps, that is the avoidable design flaws, about 50%, non-publication, 50%, and unusable reports, like the non-drug interventions, about 50%. And if you multiply those together, it's technically 87.5, but we rounded it down to 85% of avoidable waste in research. All of these things are avoidable. Fortunately, after that series, some funders took this seriously. So the Avir Forum was founded um, the year afterwards um, by Matt Westmore, who you can see in, right in the centre here, just, um, just to the, the left of me. Um, and Ian, you can see on the far, far left of this picture. Um, and that group has been about 40 different funders who've been meeting about twice a year ever since the Lancet series came out and trying to address this problem of waste in research because from the funders' perspective, 
um, rather than having more money, if they could reduce the waste, they'd get greater output from the research dollars they're investing. Well, that was great. That left me and Ian to work on some other things. And one of them that particularly concerned Ian was this learning from previous attempts and similar research journeys. He had written several times articles on clinical trials should begin and end with a systematic review of relevant evidence, um, which they'd updated about every four years. And the rates at which that are done, that's done, that is that a systematic review of previous evidence is done before you do a new trial is only in the range of 20 to 50 percent. That is largely it's not done. Something that the patients and public would expect to be done but isn't. And that's partly because of the difficulty of doing it. Um, Ian would repeatedly say this and I'd say, but Ian, it takes about two years to do a systematic review. You can't expect people to wait that long. But we've been working on the problem now for about 10 years on how to make it faster particularly using automation tools that we've been developing over the whole range of steps of a systematic review. And in 2019, we managed to do our first two-week systematic review. That is dramatically lower the time it took to, to do a review and make it possible to do the review before new research and hence solve a, one part of that research waste problem. And since then, it's had our tools now have had over a million page views, about 10,000 users, and the head of the CDC um, librarian um, said that this was a gift to the world doing this. So this was my um, strategy number four, is to build better tools. This reduces the research waste, but also makes a lot of the other work that I've been trying to do on non-drug treatments, etc., much easier to do because the reviews are so much easier to do. And we established in 2014 the International Collaboration for the Automation of Systematic Reviews, which set up these principles of how you go about automating a systematic review. So, what should I work on? Here's Mr. Squiggle's strategy again. It's those um, five big things. Focus on big problems. Document and understand the problem before you try and solve it. Learn from previous attempts and similar journeys. Build better tools. Keep your eye on the big problem, but also focus on the interesting accidents as well. So I wouldn't have described that at the beginning of my research journey, but in retrospect, I feel like I was working on that evidence practice gap the whole time, but just kept discovering new parts of that mountain range of problems that form the gap between research and practice. So I hope some of that's been helpful for your future research career or clinical career because it's relevant to both or a joint career in both clinical medicine and in, uh, in research. And I wish you all the best with that. Thank you.